You may be seated. I invite you to hear these words from the 34th chapter of Exodus. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. These are words from long ago for all of God's people today. Thanks be to God. Today we begin our, what Pastor Katie and I refer to fondly as a series, not series, which does not mean that we're not serious. We're going to be talking about the character of God from time to time throughout the year in kind of the spaces between other series, just to give us a little rest in between, kind of a one-off, but it'll be strung together. So you have to pay attention all the way between now and December to this character of God as we talk about the things we find in this Exodus passage where it, it tells us that God is, offers grace and love and compassion, that God is faithful and slow to anger. We're gonna talk about some of these things at different times throughout the year to remind ourselves who God is and perhaps in reminding ourselves of that to remember who God is not. God's not mad at you, for example. God would like us to do better, <laughs> but God's not mad at us. That's an interesting, we have trouble with that kind of thing sometimes. So we're gonna have these little conversations. Today we're gonna talk about grace. Before we do, would you be in prayer with me? God, we're thankful in this Easter season for resurrection, for mercy and grace for salvation, for your presence with us as you promised. In these next moments, would you let my words and all of our ponderings be acceptable in your sight? And more than that, be what you would have them to be so that we might take something with us when we go. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. Have you ever played miniature golf? The kind with windmills and alligators and, water, and ponds of water and ramps and slopes and tunnels and, and jumps and you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Say yes. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't, just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I was a kid, there was official putt-putt golf, which was a, you don't see that name anymore because it was, it, somebody owned that name and you can't use it. Putt-putt golf had the orange barriers and the, and the green and, and it was, there was a specific way it was laid out and all of this. There were competitions you could see on TV. We would go, my brother and I, in turn, spend a week with, at our grandparents on my dad's side. We did ever went together for some reason. <laughs> and, and so we always sent one at a time. <laughs> I assume because our childhood hobby was to try to injure one another, uh, most of which wasn't permanent. But anyway, um, yeah, so we would go spend a week at Grandma's house, and I think my parents thought they were getting rid of us, and maybe that was part of it. But for us, it was a week to go get spoiled rotten. It was marvelous. We'd have ice cream, and we'd go to the movies, and my grandfather would take me to McDonald's for a Big Mac and a chocolate shake. And I will tell you, on a day when it's one of those kinds of days, you ever have one of those? I can go to McDonald's for a Big Mac and a milkshake, don't tell the doctor, and feel better for a moment. It doesn't solve the problems, but there's something about those kinds of things, right? And one of the things my grandfather would do was take me to play mini golf, and I don't know in hindsight whether that was just the only thing he knew to do with a small person <laughs> or what, but it, we enjoyed it. We had a good time. He always won. You've seen a small person the first time they play miniature golf, and maybe they've seen somebody play real golf before, and they've got a club, and every club is a driver when you're five. And you swing it way back, big dramatic swing, and the ball goes somewhere, and you go get a new one from the little cut on the... And your grandfather says, well, that was a good swing but the hole is only that far away. 
So what if, let me show you. And of course, his went in, which I think was luck. But, and I had a chance for a do-over. And it didn't get marked. He made a point of showing me, I'm not going to count that one. But he kept score, and he always won. So, you know, there you go. So he taught me how. But I got a do-over, and it didn't count. And the next one was a little better. It didn't go in like his did, but at least it stayed in the boundaries of the hole. This subject of grace, this concept of grace can feel to us like it's just a do-over. That it doesn't count. There's no scorekeeping. It's just you get to try again. Doesn't matter what you do. Do what you want. Because there's grace. So I can punch you in the nose. Say, well, Jesus loves me. Sorry. Obviously, that's not the case. In our spirits, we know there's something more than that that's expected as a response, perhaps, to grace. Sometimes we get that mixed up and we turn it into how we earn grace. And we don't earn grace. It's a gift. Jesus comes and lives with us and there's something about death and resurrection, this whole Easter story where there's grace, there's salvation, there's reconciliation, there is connection with God again and it's a gift just as Jesus offers to a thief next to him on a cross see you on the other side that's a literal translation see you on the other side Yeah. you'll be with me in paradise it's a gift we don't earn it and yet it's not a gift to be received lightly Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a little book in 1937, so it's been around for a little while, which also tells me this conversation about whether grace is free and what we need to do about it has been around for a little while. He wrote this book titled The Cost of Discipleship. And for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the cost of discipleship was a realization that he needed to leave the United States and go back to Nazi Germany, where he died for his faithfulness. So he knew something about the cost of discipleship, I guess. And he writes these words, cheap grace is the grace we bestow upon ourselves. Cheap grace is the idea of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. So I've been thinking about this grace idea for pondering it around for a couple of weeks as I knew this day today was coming to talk about it a little bit and try to make some sort of sense out of it. It's like, what do you, what do, you do with that? And I've realized there's, uh, or realized again, I think it's something I sort of knew, but it, it's, it's come back around for me to think of grace as a process not as a one-time event. Sometimes we reduce this idea of salvation to, well, you said, yes, you're good to go, and that's it. But I think it's more than that. I hope it's more than that, because uh, while I said yes some many years ago, um, I'm still not totally good to go. How about you? I got, I got some rough edges yet. And you, you might be aware of that in your own life. There's things that, well, I'm working on it. There's a little kid's t-shirt I've seen before that says, be patient with me. I'm a work in progress. God still loves me, but I'm not done. The first part is receiving this business of grace. It's a gift, but someone can't give us a gift unless we accept it. And as we accept it, we learn along the way, we're supposed, as we told our kids about learning, we get to say thank you. That's part of receiving a gift, is saying thank you. That's part of why we're here together today, to say thank you to God for loving us, for creating us, for giving us one another, for our lives together in this place and out there together with whoever else. 
We might say thank you in worship. We might say thank you alone in prayer. We might say thank you singing a song. It may or may not be an official church song, and that's okay. It's that gratitude welling up. We might say thank you journaling, writing about it. We receive the gift and say thank you. But then it's the next part. It's just like the golf game. If I had my do-over with my club and I hit another drive past the clubhouse into the street, well, Grandpa showed me a better way. Tone it down, Pete. <laughs> Hit it a little softer. Repentance is that turning, that learning, that growing. And how can I do a little better next time? Or maybe go a little longer before I make that same old mistake again. Whichever it happens to be for you. Right? If we receive the gift without the repentance, that's, that's the cheap grace Bonhoeffer is complaining about. He describes a costly grace that requires us to put our whole selves in as if we might lose our lives to save them. And in turning, just like the thief who turns on that cross, just like so many stories you know, in turning, God meets us in that spot and helps us do it. We don't do it on our own strength. The Holy Spirit works in and among and through us, around us, sometimes through our friends, sometimes through strangers, sometimes just that little nudge in the back of your mind that says, hey, no more Fritos and French onion dip or whatever it is. Think about Thomas, right? It's, we're at the week after Easter and so you remember Doubting Thomas? It's a terrible nickname and Thomas teaches us something Jesus appears to a group of disciples in a locked room shortly after resurrection. They're hiding because they're afraid of what might happen to them next. And so they're in this room. They got the door locked and I, the blinds closed. I don't know. They're in there like, what's going to happen next? What's, this isn't what we expected. It's not what we signed up for. What's going on? And Jesus appears and says, hey guys, how you doing? That's the literal translation again. Yeah. And they're like, wow, it's you. Yeah, I told you. You didn't understand, but now I'm going to start helping you understand. Don't, I, I can't hang around, but I can stop by. And so they're very excited. And of course, as anyone who's very excited, if Jesus showed up in this room today and said, hey, it's good to see you, you'd be like, wow. And you'd go tell your friends when you left here. Right? Say yes. Okay, good. Yeah. We'd be preachers of the gospel in a new and different way if that happened. And it does happen in a figurative way, so tell your friends. So they do this and they tell Thomas, Thomas, guess what? Jesus showed up in that room. And Thomas, Thomas knows this room. He's been around. He's, he's, he's a man of, of life and the world and he understands the door was locked, guys. People don't go through locked doors. You're, wow, guys, what's going on? No way. I, if I, until I see it for myself and put my fingers in his hands where the wounds are, I, I got, no, I don't believe it. Well, a week later, Thomas is with the, I'm guessing Thomas was always with the disciples after that because <laughs> he didn't want to miss something. So they're in this same room again and Jesus shows up, but Thomas is there. And the first thing Jesus says is, peace be with you. So I'm thinking they're startled a little bit that someone has appeared in their midst through a locked door as one would be. And the first person he talks to is Thomas. And he says, Thomas, take a look. Put your, put your finger. That's grace. Thomas doubted. He didn't believe someone else's word. He wanted to see it for himself. He was skeptical. He didn't accept it on faith. And Jesus said, okay, I'll meet you where you're at. Whatever you got going on, okay. It's not perfect. It's not shiny. Whatever. Where you at? I'll come find you. Just like God seeks Adam and Eve in a garden, Jesus comes and finds Thomas. He says, put your fingers. That's grace. But the story doesn't end there in the Gospel of John. The very next thing that happens, and you might remember this, is Thomas responds and says, my Lord and my God. 
There's repentance in that statement. There's turning back to his faithfulness in that statement. And the story continues from there until this moment, and here we are. And Thomas believing was part of, is part of that story. It's part of how we're here. Those disciples go on to be the church and to tell the stories. And God is always working in this grace process where we receive the gift and we say thank you and then we turn and try to do a little better and try to do a little better and try to do little, and we progress from crawling <laughs> to walking to running to driving to playing baseball and we learn when we putt just a little tap will do it because the lessons sink in and it's always a process and even though Jesus says on the cross it is finished because the work is finished in that sense we know that it's an ongoing process for us in our lives you can't 